Oh boy, here we go. I've been putting off doing this video for so long because this topic is so dang radioactive. But you know what? Let's fight. Today we're doing the 20 hidden duds from The Simpsons Golden Age. We all love these episodes. We know them like the backs of our hands. Obviously, none of these are duds in the absolute sense. But everyone, everyone has those classics that they're cooler on. Those episodes they're less enthusiastic about. So let's have fun with this. We all know these episodes are great, so this is a safe space for negativity. Which episodes are your least favorite? Ah, but before you say another Simpsons clip show or Homer's Odyssey, we're gonna do hard mode, meaning seasons three through eight only and no clip shows. Come on, we got this. Let's make those difficult calls. Now, I'm not interested in doing a bottom 20 list. Instead, we're going the hot ones route and going easiest to hardest. Trot out the easiest, most predictable stuff first, and finish with the spiciest, most challenging picks. Those are the rules, so let's get this show on the road. Let's start out with a fairly chalky pick, as My Sister, My Sitter has always been a punching bag for Simpsons fans. To its credit, most of its jokes work pretty well. There's some fun observational gags about outdoor malls at the Squidport, and the domestic scenes with Lisa shows off our favorite character's quirks. I mean, this is the episode with Go to Bread, which was one of the most quoted jokes among me and my sisters. However, I don't think My Sister, My Sitter is all that fun. Act 3 has got to be the most miserable act in the first nine seasons, watching Bart snipe at Lisa, and then Lisa making increasingly idiotic and desperate decisions. Bart is a giant asshole in this episode, but he also shouldn't have even been put in this situation. It's baffling that Homer and Marge think this is a good idea, and the episode barely tries to justify it. Really, the whole plot concept is kind of a bad fit in general, trying to do this teenager story with eight-year-old Lisa. The whole situation just comes off as one of those contrived sitcom plots that The Simpsons should be better than. Combine that with a comedy of errors act three that is more miserable than fun, and you get one of the worst Oakley and Weinstein era efforts. I'm not going to mince words on this one. This is my least favorite episode on this list, the one season seven episode I regularly skip. You know how when talking about The Simpsons' decline, they always describe the shift to nonsensical, outlandish plots that don't really resolve themselves? In this one, Sideshow Bob gets so butthurt about TV that he steals an atomic bomb, tries to detonate it, and then kidnaps Bart and hijacks the Wright Flyer. I appreciate how, after Cape Fear, The Simpsons actively shifted Bob away from purely Bart revenge stories. I think addressing his backstory and legacy with Krusty was a smart idea. Wrapping this concept around a terrorist act isn't the best execution of that idea. The airshow set piece itself is fairly boring. It's inherently an activity that isn't fun to watch people doing. Screw it, throw in some box kites. Most of the military stuff is all right, and R. Lee Ermey gives a memorable performance as Colonel Hap Hapablap. But overall, it's a very flimsy story where they repeatedly have to contrive ways to keep things moving along. Homer vs. Patty and Selma has got to be the most sitcom-y episode of the first eight seasons. Let's contrive a reason why Homer desperately needs money so his hated sister-in-laws have a hold over him. Since this is season six, the actual execution of these moments are generally great. The pumpkin thing is a hilarious bungle, and I love the cartoony feud he has with Patty and Selma. A lot of offbeat wordplay jokes, too. You can't spell obsequious without I-O-U. But every single plot point feels like I'm watching a mediocre 90s sitcom. Here comes the strict boss to call out Patty and Selma so Homer can save the day. We have a brief limo driving subplot with maybe the most indulgent joke in classic Simpsons. I love Mel Brooks. I wish so much that the writers gave him something better than a hey remember this joke. The Bart Ballet B plot is generally fine. It's mostly worthwhile for Susan Sarandon's excellent performance and some iconic jokes. But at the end of the day, it's fundamentally one of those you just can't win endings that are a dime a dozen. 
Overall, while the execution does elevate Homer vs. Patty and Selma from its sitcom contemporaries, it doesn't live up to Season 6's lofty standards. Lady Bouvier's Lover is an episode that fundamentally doesn't care about Grandpa and Jacqueline and makes me not care either. You watch this thing for its jokes, and that's it. Because it's not going to try to invest you in their relationship. Old money, this ain't. We're not going to get much POV from these two, just a couple hangouts in this scene. They try to sell the sweetness of this with the music cue, but Jacqueline is such a cold fish, you don't get why Grandpa falls for her. Thank God Mr. Burns shows up to inject some energy into this thing. I think there could be a lot of fun had with a Burns Grandpa fight for her affections, Instead, they build toward a wedding where they have to convince her that Burns is awful. I do love the Smithers angle, how much he absolutely hates the whole thing and sabotages it. Like, there's legitimately some great character dynamics to this thing. Even finishing with an elaborate reference to The Graduate is pretty fun. But once again, the episode doesn't invest the audience into the characters, and it's not absurd enough to enjoy it as a wacky romp. It falls uncomfortably in the middle. Also, Bart has a B-plot about Scratchy's arm or something. Dog of Death drives me nuts, because its first half is so good, but this thing always loses me in the end, and I've never understood why. That lottery in Act 1 is just classic Simpsons through and through. It satirizes part of our culture, poking fun at how Homer gets caught in a dream. It's the perfect vehicle for showing off the secondary characters, jumping all over town. Magnets. Always with the magnets. Hell, even the main issue with Santa's Little Helper is super interesting and relatable. So many families have struggled with the same problem. The Simpson family coming to resent Santa's Little Helper rings true. I think the problem, and why this ending has never worked for me, is that the episode doesn't sell their relationship with their dog. It's entirely interested in the money stuff, so it struggles in converting to a dynamic of, OMG, we love and miss him so much. I do like some of the jokes with Mr. Burns, it's just this danger scenario doesn't feel like the culmination of everything else we just went through. They end up leaning on the a boy and his dog dynamic that we all understand. I don't know, maybe I'm being too hard on this one, because I watch it and it does give me those season 3 warm fuzzies. It unfortunately ends up as one of those great concepts that doesn't quite stick the landing. Oh wow, two dog episodes in a row. The Real Jims Hates Dogs confirmed. Nah, I love dogs. I just feel like the Simpsons writers can struggle with Santa's little helper stories. The Canine Mutiny does a much better job with the relational aspect, keeping him in the picture more and even using his name. In addition, this improves upon the Lady Bouvier's Lover B-plot and lets Bart have fun with his credit card. However, the actual character dynamics don't live up to scrutiny. Somehow, Marge is even more brain dead than in My Sister, My Sitter, not wondering how Bart can afford all of this and being 100% hands off for some reason. The whole situation with the blind guy does a better job than Mr. Burns in paying off the story. Bart at least gets a character arc, even if it amounts to Bart Simpson is trash. At the same time, the resolution is so random and bizarre, I can't tell if it's awesome or the kind of modern Simpsons thing that we all complain about. Love that jammin' song, though. I feel guilty putting this on the list because I've always been kind of a canine mutiny apologist. I've heard of folks who think this is the weakest non-clip show of the era. While I don't think it's that bad, I have to agree that it's below average for season 8. Brother Can You Spare Two Dimes is one of the rare Simpsons episodes where I think the discourse ruined it. You know, the oh brother where art thou discourse about Herb's management, how it's fundamentally his fault for not overseeing his stupid half-brother. After every think piece discussed that to death, this follow-up feels kind of weird. How much Herb blames Homer for everything, how Homer feels like he has to atone by loaning him money. The brother's relationship isn't especially fun. It's just Herb returning and being a dick to Homer for most of it. And they end up going with this baby translator as his big invention, something I have no idea how Herb was able to do, and I'm wondering why it didn't immediately change the world. Usually, I absolutely hate that kind of argument, especially for a show like The Simpsons, but I'll make an exception here. 
Herb is basically a wizard. Even the down-to-earth aspect, Homer's search for a new couch, is on the who-the-hell-cares end of the spectrum. I love how we get there with the awards show, and even the couch shopping is fun. We're not exactly dealing with the highest stakes here. I get why they were keen to bring Herb back and turn things around, but this sequel episode doesn't bring much to the table. What's this? How can secrets of a successful marriage be on a list of classic era duds? It's got the dissing your fly girl scene. How can an episode be below average with all these learning annex jokes in it? Well, the thing is, Homer is such an asshole in this episode. He is absolutely insufferable here, the way he continually disrespects Marge. These two have had plenty of marriage crisis episodes, but most of the time, Homer is bumbling around being thoughtless and ignorant, whereas here, she's literally telling him to stop gossiping, and he doesn't even care. And then, bafflingly, they go for the super subversive ending, where the only thing Homer can give is his dependence. What the hell is that? Homer is terrible for most of the episode, and then you go for the gimmicky grand gesture that no one would ever buy? I walk away wishing that Midge would dump that zero and get with the hero. I don't mean to be way more negative on this one than the others, because once again, dissing your fly girl is here. There's good moments for sure, but oof at all that Homer and Marge stuff. Probably could have dialed that back a little. Fear of Flying is such an awkward episode of The Simpsons, and how you have a solid core concept set up by a very funny opening segment, but all the story beats are about stuff that the series doesn't really care about. It's about Marge's fear of flying, which has never existed before or since, and the root of her problem is her father, who is barely a character on the series. You get what I mean? I enjoy her therapy scenes with Anne Bancroft's character, these two have an excellent rapport, and Homer's paranoia and defensiveness is very cute as a change of pace. In addition, her therapy sessions give the writers free reign to do as many punchy references and parodies as they want. But when they get to the end with the big reveal, it always lands with a thud. It's not silly enough to be funny on that level, and we don't know Marge's dad enough for it to be an unexpected twist on his character. Maybe I just hate Mr. Bouvier in general, as I was unimpressed with this season 34 reveal as well. I think with these Simpsons episodes, you need some familiar character hook to keep our bearings. And Fear of Flying is too alien for the rest of the series. It's like an evolutionary dead end of classic Simpsons. Everybody loves Rodney Dangerfield. He was a national treasure. But this episode is a lot of Rodney Dangerfield. For once, I'm not going to pick on the story for being below average, because yeah, Act 3 turns into a phony kidnapping plot, and their father-son relationship is weak, even by Mr. Burns' standards. But honestly, I think the casual and slapdash approach is well suited to a Rodney Dangerfield vehicle. The ending is very clear that this is a dumb party episode and nothing more. Doing this snobs versus schlobs shtick with Rodney is right in his wheelhouse. On the other hand, he really does just dominate this thing. It feels less like a Simpsons episode and more like some celebrity spin-off, like this is a stealth pilot. There's very little balance to the humor, not much else going on in the story. It's not like the Critic episode, where there's a Homer Marge plot and a bunch of movies as a change of pace from Jay. This is all Rodney all the time. It feels weird making this criticism, because like I said, I love Rodney Dangerfield, but this is The Simpsons, and there's not enough Simpsons in this for me. I remember in the audio commentary, the writer said that this was the episode that killed Otto's prominence as a supporting character. And they were probably right. While the Otto show is obviously not a disaster by any means, it's crystal clear that the writers just don't know what to do with this guy. Still remember Mike Reese joking, Hey, it's the Otto Show, when he finally shows up. The whole thing is essentially a shaggy dog story from start to finish. We have fun with Bart seeing the Spinal Taps, featuring their special brand of obliviousness and general incompetence. Then it turns into Bart wanting to be a rock star. Then it turns into Otto losing his job and living with the Simpsons. Then it hinges its finale on Otto passing a driver's test. 
Wow, these Act 3 DMV tests are really taking a beating today. I do appreciate how self-aware the episode is about Bart's aborted storyline. Feels like a Season 10 joke, time traveling back to Season 3. But it's replaced with auto household stuff that never becomes interesting. And Skinner being stuck in traffic is amusing, but there's not much to it. It's nice that the writers gave Otto a shot here, but it's clear that he isn't someone they connect with. Maybe with a different writer's room, Otto could have become the breakout character. I've always had a soft spot for Homer Palooza, but even I have to admit that it's not one of season seven's best. It's mostly one celebrity joke after another in its back half, in the vein of something like Krusty Gets Busted or Homer at the Bat. But the Krusty episode is full of performing actors and comedians, and Homer at the Bat is totally cuckoo bananas. Instead, we're listening to the Smashing Pumpkins and Cypress Hill deliver Simpsons dialogue. The material is decent, it's just kind of sleepy. There's definitely some of that how do you do fellow kids energy to this whole thing, the kind of gimmick that's easy to feel cynical about. I'm more positive on that argument, as it is cool seeing the Simpsons explore a new territory. They're clearly leaning into how out of place they feel with all the Homer stuff. From a characterization standpoint, Homer's arc feels relatable and true to his character. Overall, I do think there's value in having this time capsule episode of the 1990s. It just unfortunately runs into some of the problems the later years can struggle with. Homer Palooza is like if the classic Simpsons staff wrote the best version of a season 11 episode. All right, I'm putting my foot down. The Secret War of Lisa Simpson doesn't work as a Lisa plot. Yes, yes, her emotional moment listening to her mom's message is sad and effective, but why is she even here? Why did they decide to do the Shannon Faulkner Citadel story with Lisa Simpson as the protagonist? In Act 1, they sell the audience on how bad Springfield Elementary is and how Lisa wants a challenge, but nah, I don't buy it. I don't believe that Lisa would want to go to a military school. It results in a story where she repeatedly gets dumped on by the mean boys and fails at everything she tries. We don't even get the satisfaction of Lisa beating the shit out of the mean boys at some challenge. They do this Eliminator thing in Act 3, but it's more of a Lisa versus nature battle than Lisa directly overcoming the mean boys. I will grant that Bart adds an extra dimension to the story, easily its best aspect. But everything else about it feels stereotypical and contrived. I've seen this kind of story so many times before. Ugh, this one hurts so much because act two of Margin Chains is one of the best acts of season four. It's so good. The moment Lionel Hutz shows up, it's one iconic joke after another. It pains me to know that the world without lawyers joke will show up on this list. But oh god, the first and third acts of this episode drop the ball so hard. It starts out strong with the Osaka flu stuff, all that works. But the accidental shoplifting conflict with Apu is so contrived. It ages particularly badly since Apu knows Marge so well now. You watch this and are like, what the hell Apu? Them celebrating and saying they're putting that bitch in jail is probably the worst moment of the first four seasons. Then we get an act three in which the Simpsons writers try to imagine what a woman's prison experience is like, coupled with bland moments of Springfield realizing how much they value Marge. I don't know if anyone else feels the same way, but this Jimmy Carter joke is just bizarre, and for some reason, they opt to end on it. Weird choices all around. I think if either Acts 1 or 3 were stronger, there's no way Margin Chains would be on this list. It's just one of those special unicorn episodes that peak so much in the middle. You know how I sometimes describe the David Merkin era as having a lot of those large-scale stories that often affect the whole town? Well, Bart's inner child is like the blander version of that format. It does many of the things, as a Homer the Vigilante or a Springfield, but with less energy and focus. The trampoline stuff is awesome, of course. It's honestly my favorite part of the episode. It's so damn good. I wish it were attached to a main storyline better suited to it. 
When people talk about Albert Brooks's Great Simpsons roles, Brad Goodman isn't top of mind because he's honestly kind of dull. The script doesn't give Brooks much room to be his eccentric self. I really enjoy the Bart angle, that he loses a sense of self-identity because of the town. I just wish the episode figured out a way to explore this more. Instead, it turns the festival into another angry mob and a chase scene that isn't really a chase scene. Act 3 isn't terrible or anything. It's honestly one of the best Act 3s on this dubious list. But I find myself wondering what the point of the whole thing was. Bart's inner child fundamentally has a bunch of good little ideas and then just kind of smashes them all together. I think the audio commentary might have ruined the magic of the front for me. In it, they were describing how it was the end of season 4, the writers were very tired, and this episode came in way too short. They did every little possible thing to stretch this thing out. Extended opening credits, reusing animation, even doing that everybody loves Ned Flanders thing at the end. It's hard to watch it now without noticing how it's barely holding together by its threads. The main storyline is pretty solid, all things considered. It's fun watching Bart and Lisa come up with ideas and enter the world of animation with Grandpa. The story doesn't go anywhere that interesting. At the very least, it's an amusing glimpse into the industry. It's paired with a mostly unremarkable B-plot about Homer's reunion and going back to finish high school. The reunion jokes are a bunch of boomer jokes I am way too young for, and the school stuff is like two scenes long. It's amazing how this episode came in short, and yet still very little happens in it. I suspect this might be the hottest take on this list, as I know plenty of people who love Whacking Day, but I've always been a bit cooler on it. It feels like a mix of the P.T. Hattis bands and Lisa the Iconoclast, but isn't as successful in either role. Marge and Bart definitely do have their share of memorable moments. She is able to reach him and get him interested in history, taking an amusing field trip, but it never quite builds toward anything. The same could be said for the main Whacking Day plot. We get Lisa sitting around the whole time, complaining about how much she hates it. There's no energy to it, no get up and go. Bart and Lisa just sit around until they rope in Barry White for their music scheme to save the snakes. Also I gotta say, this is the most season 4 episode ever with its cutaway gags. It's like Seth MacFarlane produced this thing. To be honest, I mostly watch Whacking Day for three things. One, Superintendent Chalmers visit. Two, Barry White's amazing musical number. And three, Homer preparing for Whacking Day. Everybody, we did it. We found the episode that is so schmaltzy, even the real Jims objects to it. Yes, the real Jims is speaking in third person. Yes, I will stop now. I feel like a bad person right now because I know many people love this moment, but that reprise of Jazzman is too much. It's so damn sugary, I feel like I need to drink six to eight glasses of water after watching it. I love the core concept, bringing Bleeding Gums Murphy back and letting Lisa explore her feelings of grief. And all the Bart stuff, although somewhat shallow, is still hilarious and dovetails with the Lisa storyline. I suppose hinging Act 3 on buying that record is somewhat flimsy as actual stakes. They play it more as a tribute to Bleeding Gums, but I would argue that this is more about Lisa finding her own sense of closure. It's just the combination of the surreal elements, the magical strike of lightning, the feel-good Jazzman tribute at the end. This is the ending of a Disney movie, not a Simpsons episode. If I wanted this much sugar, I would go watch Lisa's Rival. Bart the Fink is probably the best episode on this list, in my opinion. There's not a ton really wrong with it, so to speak. Something has to be bottom three in season seven, and unfortunately, it's Bart the Fink. My main knock against this one is the mystery angle. It builds itself up well, culminating in the captivating and oddly haunting moment of Krusty flying into the cliff. There's some nice intrigue in Act 3 with Bart mysteriously seeing this figure everywhere. But they don't have much time to devote to this intrigue. Bart and Lisa stumble into the marina, confront him, and goad him into coming back. There's not much of a showdown here. The confrontation and resolution are limp and lifeless. Other than that, 
Bart the Fink is a fun, crusty romp through the world of tax fraud. Funny auction jokes, IRS burger, his retooled show, Bob Newhart's painfully awkward eulogy, plenty of great stuff in this. If it had a stronger Act 3, I think people would talk about this one more often. Ugh, I struggled so much with this last pick. Bart Gets an Elephant is a certified classic. It's got our main man Stampy after all, that giant elephant jerk that we all love so much. It's got iconic gags too. Everything about Homer's elephant business is comedy gold. On the other hand, this episode is kind of stupid. I love this thing to death, but I have to admit it's pretty dumb. They give us the premise of what if the Simpson family somehow got an elephant, which is of course amazing, but you quickly realize there's not a ton of stuff they can functionally do with an elephant at the Simpsons house. It's just Lisa giving the rundown of how to take care of it, Homer's fun business stuff, and then it turns into Lisa's pony when the family can't afford it. The tar pits ending is funny, but it is kind of a non sequitur set piece. It's just an odd direction to take the climax of this story. This was literally the last episode I chose for this list, so obviously I think Bart Gets an Elephant has a lot of great things going for it. I just prefer other stuff a little more. The Golden Years have wacky farce episodes I think are a bit smarter, as well as character relationship stories better than Bart and Stampy. You just heard me shit talk a bunch of Simpsons classics, so I should probably underline again that I don't think any of these episodes are bad. Well, except for maybe that Sideshow Bob terrorist plot. The Golden Age of the Simpsons is home to some of the best episodes in television history, so figuring out your least favorites is like finding the least shiny diamond. Turns out I'm finicky about the quality of the diamonds Act 3s. Let me know in the comments what episodes you would put on such a difficult list. If you really hate any of my picks, let me know what you would swap into its place. Just don't pick any of my favorites. Those diamonds are all flawless. As always, thanks for watching.